My name is Rachel Siegel, and I'm a recovering workaholic. <laughs> it's been 23 months since I commuted to work. 26 months since I couldn't sleep without my Blackberry by my bed, or in my pocket on a weekend, or on the table at dinner. 37 months since I preferred my desk at the office to my bed at home. A couple of years ago, my partner Scott and I hit a crossroads. It was a typical weeknight, at home, making dinner, and without knowing it, my eye is constantly looking for that blinky red light on the Blackberry. Just making dinner, looking for it, making dinner, looking for it. Looking for that person that needs me, that client that has an urgent request, someone that I need to respond to. Naturally, the light goes off. I'm complaining about all the work I still need to do. I'm going to be up until all hours of the night. Pick it up, respond to it, put it back down, and I look up. And that's when my partner looked at me and said, sometimes I wonder if you need this. This. This was my job. This was my, my job as an account director for a prominent agency. But it was more than this. It was the satisfaction that I seemed to get by being needed at all hours, which led to this expectation in myself that I needed to be available at all hours, beyond the call of duty, living, breathing, and ultimately always prioritizing work. I'm not sure if it was the question that he asked or the way that he asked it, but somehow I knew that things needed to change. I had just gone through about 12 months' worth of crazy upheaval, life change, a very expensive, painful divorce, job relocation to a new city with lots more travel and new responsibilities. It was a lot for somebody to take in a decade, let alone a year. But that wasn't enough. I didn't realize that this goodbye that I had said to this old life of mine of being this career-driven, high-heel-wearing career woman in the city, I still hadn't come into my own. I still hadn't figured out what I really wanted. I was still prioritizing work over everything else in my life. You see, this concept of work-life balance, you may have heard of it, didn't really work for me. I was fully aware of the hours that I was keeping, fully aware of all this time I was spending on my computer, and yet I seemed to enjoy it. I seemed to enjoy canceling personal plans because a client needed me like I was Superman and I needed to save the day. It all seemed so much more important than what was actually important to me. Then I heard this term work-life blending. Okay, okay, yeah, I can do that. I can totally work-life blend. That makes to so much sense to me. In practice, work-life blending for me just meant that I was constantly blending work into my life, but it's not like life ever got to blend into work. In 2012, I joined the US population who works freelance, a mere 2.9%. I jumped ahead of the forecast that by 2020, 40% of Americans will be contractor freelance employees. I work from home, I set my own hours, I'm able to work directly with clients and do what I want on my own schedule, oftentimes in pajamas, not looking like this or with my hair like this. I don't have to be at a desk. I can keep my own schedule. I don't have to be somewhere at 9 o'clock in the morning. At any time, if I've got a moment between conference calls, I can check in on my chickens and my goats. Oh. <laughs> right. As part of this transition to being my own boss, my partner Scott and I, the person that I had that crossroads conversation with, we relocated to a remote island 45% larger than Manhattan in landmass, but with less than 1% of the population. A mere 1,000 people occupy Cortez Island year-round. Six hours and at least two ferry rides away from any major city, limited cell phone reception, possible lengthy power outages in the winter, wolves occasionally gracing the mountains behind us with their haunting howls. It sounds like the perfect spot to set up shop as a digital strategist, right? <laughs> Yeah. See, as part of this decision to become our own boss, Scott and I both realized that we didn't have to be in the city anymore if we didn't want to. We had already chosen a home as far away from Vancouver as we could get without creating an impossible daily commute. Now we could go anywhere. 
We were ready to and we needed to, for each other, go farther, really challenge ourselves. Our first stop? Where else? Craigslist. This was how we found a cabin warmed by a wood-burning stove, powered by solar and water, situated on 300 acres of forest and farmland. Completely off the grid, 90% of the food grown or raised right there. No cell phone reception. Not a single bar. Trust me, I tried. <laughs> we made a pact with each other to be there for at least a year. For better or for worse, we were in this, milking cows, chopping wood, collecting eggs, together. If we hated it, not a problem. On to the new adventure. That's the benefit of liberating ourselves from the constraints of commute boundaries and employee contracts. I'd be lying if I didn't say it was a rather long year. <laughs> Lots of ups and downs and learning as we figured out this juggle between freelance life online and homesteading ambitions. We're in a remote area, internet sometimes spotty, cell phones don't work, so we're reliant on a landline. There's, there's going to be challenges. Now, we're still there. We've moved to a different spot where we have a bit more autonomy, a bit more land that we can do work for ourselves um, and raise our own animals with ducks, chickens, goats, and some pigs that were with us up until two weeks ago. <laughs> Along with our new daughter, who probably won't always just want to be swaddled in our arms, much as we hate to admit it. She now has this beautiful island to run around on. She'll probably ask for a pony one day. We're probably gonna get her a pony. <laughs> this strange mix of homegrown and hyper-digital living, it's our bliss. It's not a relevant recipe for what everybody would want, and that's at least part of the point. A single one-size-fits-all recipe, this career trajectory that you think you need to be on, it doesn't need to be that way no matter what career counselors and HR professionals try to tell you. Sometimes it's beneficial. Sometimes you need to color outside the lines a bit. Change what's expected. Don't be so predictable. Don't do just what you were told to do after college. That traditional trajectory of life milestones doesn't have to look the way that it looks for everybody else. Be more than what you want. It should be more than what you need. It should be about what really matters to you and not other people's expectations. But my story isn't about why everyone needs backyard chickens, a goat in their life, or to grow their own food. Although, there was a study done a few years ago about British farmers that found that they were actually the most happy individuals in the entire country. Meanwhile, on our own soil, we're seeing upwards of 70% of Americans feeling disengaged, even saying that they hate their jobs. That's crazy. Even if you're able to keep to a 40-hour week and never let work frustrations ever impact your weekends, because when would that ever happen? Even if you're able to do that, that's still 2,000 hours a year of unhappiness. So why do we do it? Why do we work? But that isn't really the question. We all have bills to pay. Okay, so maybe the question is, how do we allow ourselves to break away from these jobs that we don't like that aren't fulfilling, that have to be conducted in these offices with people that we don't enjoy working with. Except, I had all of those things, and I didn't hate it. I never hated my job, I never hated the company. When I was still chasing that corporate dream, I loved the people, many of whom I'm still in touch with today. I worked in a great office, and the day-to-day -day responsibilities, well, I'm still doing that just in between juggling a newborn and planting this year's seedlings. So I couldn't have hated it that much. In fact, I really enjoy the work that I do as a digital strategist. So it's not as simple as having the right job. Nor is it just about having the life. Even though I enjoy eggs for my own flock of chickens much more than the best brunch spot in the city, it's not that I was that miserable 37 long months ago or that, to be honest, I would ever turn down brunch when I'm in the city based on eggs. Our life may look idyllic in the photos that we capture, perfect, but it's selective. It looks carefree, but let's be honest, it's a farm with dozens of animals. <laughs> if I was realistic in the depiction of what that looked like, there would be a lot more photos of poop. <laughs> Thank you.
There are certainly days where I do not want to pull on my boots and trudge out into the rain and feed the animals. I'd really rather ignore that rooster and stay snuggled up in bed. And other days when it gets really cold that I wish there was just a little box on the wall that I could just turn it up and it would get warmer. Instead, I have to wait for the fire to get going. And then there's heat, this magic called heat. Yet when those momentary lapses, those moments where we get grumpy about this, when they pass and when we actually sit back and go, okay, well, we could change that and we could have all of those things that we've given up, wouldn't change it. So it's not just as simple as I'm happy now and I wasn't happy then. It's that then, 37 months ago, I just wasn't happy enough. A good friend of mine also chose to forgo the typical career path. He hung up his suit and tie in Toronto and moved to Nicaragua and set up a, th a thriving hostel. He uses the term personal alignment to describe the process of streamlining every aspect of your life to ensure that each element that typically influences your decisions are aligned. I love that. There's flexibility in this concept of personal alignment for the reality that your elements are probably very different than my elements. And these elements that are unique to each of us are going to ultimately spell whether or not we're happy on any given day, fulfilled. Compared to work-life balance, work-life blending, personal alignment makes a lot more sense to me. Work, it'll always be something that matters in my life. I love what I do and I love working with people online and off in person. It's not a burden for me to do this work, nor is it something that I wanted to give up when I moved to the country and invested in a real pair of rubber boots. I just prefer now more than ever to schedule my conference calls in between barn chores and time in the garden. When I think back now, how working full time in the city sent me down this rabbit hole of late hours, takeout food and isolation from the person I'm supposed to be closest to, work, that job that I had, it wasn't the problem, it was a symptom. This misalignment was what led me to regularly going into the office on weekends, having the closest sushi takeout restaurant on speed dial, and just not even being aware of how disconnected I had become from my family. But exactly how do ducklings, potlucks, homemade tomato sauce create alignment? Things that take so much more time to care for, to create. My personal alignment, our collective alignment as a family, as partners, it includes a lot more than professional work and cute fuzzy animals. It would be a lot easier. It would be a lot easier if my career ambitions didn't come with this desire to be more sustainable, know where my food comes from and spend more time outdoors or in the winter by the fire. It would be a lot easier if I was satisfied in my old life where laundry was sent out food was ordered in, and my weekends were mostly just spent seeing what was new at anthropology. It would be so much more simple if we felt as close to each other just going out to a dinner and a movie as a couple. Instead, we get a lot more than sustenance when it comes to just harvesting our food and taking the time every day to maintain our homestead. Easy is expensive, and it doesn't create the same lasting memories, the same things that you want to capture in photographs. It's not the same when you buy your eggs as when you find those first eggs that came from a chicken that you raised from a peeping ball of fluff or taste a tomato that you grew from seed. Having to pull on boots and bring in wood that's gonna create the fire and heat your beyond freezing home, brutal. Until that fire is going and it's crackling and it's warm. You can't beat that. It's not easy to care for a goat that provides milk every day, twice a day, first thing in the morning, late on at night. And it's especially not easy to spend months scratching the back of a pig that is going to eventually fill your freezer and feed your family with the best possible fork, pork for over two years. But each of these relationships with each animal creates an intense amount of gratitude. When you know the pig or the cow or the chicken or the sheep who subsequently graces your table with a meal, it's by far the most challenging but the most rewarding connection that we have with these animals. One that you can't buy in a grocery store. Each time we cook, we're cognizant of this animal that gave its life and provides us with nourishment, which ultimately means 
Don't overcook those pork chops. None of these things are easy, but they're worth it. Our awareness of food goes hand in hand with the community we're now a part of on Cortez. There are only a couple restaurants on the island, a single bakery. This means get-togethers and social gatherings consist of potluck dinners, beachside barbecues, campfires. When new friendships are built through invitations into the home where you're cooking for one another, you realize the distance that often exists in larger cities where you go out, you go to the bar, you pick up a bite to eat. When I consider how many of my close friends back in Toronto never actually were in my apartment at all, that seems crazy now. The added benefit is that most folks on Cortez also grow their own food. So you can bet that the freshest ingredients, or in the winter, most well-preserved, are typically on hand, and people really know how to cook. When I think about how different my life is now from what it once was and where I was headed, I can only ask myself how it's possible that I was lucky enough to stumble on a couple of years of chaos, a tremendous amount of change, that would point me in the right direction of aligning my own elements into a custom blend perfectly suited for me. I'm grateful that this prompted this self-reflection in order to make these changes that got back to what I needed and not what I thought that I wanted. While work still plays a major part of my day, it's not everything, not even close. It offers one little piece of my own personal alignment. While everything else, the food, the people, and especially my family provides the rest. Don't wait for chaos. Don't wait for some traumatic catalyst to break your path and make you reevaluate whether or not you're on, you're living the right life for you. You don't need to look around you to see what you want. Look inside and allow yourself the privilege to ask what you really need, what makes you happy, what's worth it, and what matters most to you. Thank you.